Hello, hello, hello. It's Stephanie here and it's HMO Heroes again, live at five. And I can hardly contain myself tonight because we've got an absolute corker of a show for you, a fantastic HMO hero. And I'm going to tell you all about him in just one moment. So for those of you who don't know about HMO Heroes, it's a Facebook group uh, for information, inspiration and motivation for HMO investors and aspiring HMO investors uh, to join in that conversation. So just search on, on Facebook for HMO Heroes and we look forward to seeing you over there. And every Thursday we go live in this group with HMO Heroes who achieved inspiring, innovative, different, unique and um, very cash flow generating things, um, while also providing fantastic accommodation to people and great returns for their for themselves and their investors. So uh, let's move on to tonight's hero. Tonight joining us live is Ben Goldsmith of Goldsmith Properties. Now he and his wife, Zena's, Zena, really are superheroes of the property world. Within 18 months of starting, they had bought 18 properties, which to me is just mind blowing. And they did it post the, um, the slump and the change in mortgage regulations because they started all this from 2014. So it's it's not back in the heyday where it was buy one day and re refinance the next sort of thing. Um, they've done this very recently. Also, the other things I love about Ben is he's doing everything, HMOs, service, to, um, service to accommodation. And he's also got a pub, and we're going to come on to this later, um, that's, that will be grossing 100K a year. So that's a story and a half. And I think you're really going to enjoy that deal. On top of that, he's also uh, um, sourced over £600,000 of private finance and when I was talking to it felt like it wasn't even trying. So we'll be digging down into any tips that Ben is able to pass on to mere mortals like ourselves about how we can also do this. Just want to make sure I'm not missing anything here. Um, so I think you'll agree that he's a bit of a property uh, powerhouse. Um, before I bring Ben onto the screen tonight, I just want to say to you, remember guys, it's a two way thing tonight. So we'd love your questions, anything that you want to ask if you're just starting off in HMOs, if you're experienced in HMOs, whatever you want to ask, ask us in the comments because we would love to hear from you. Um, and I can see we've already had three comments. Oh, uh, oh, 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 right. Okay. I can't see who they are at the moment. So what I'm going to do now is without any further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Ben Goldsmith, HMO Hero. Hello, Ben, and welcome to the show. Nice, Stephanie. That's, that's quite an introduction. I just hope I can try and live up to it, okay? <laughs> you don't have to try and live up to it, Ben, because you've done all these things. You've already done it. You're fully qualified. So, um, Ben, what I want to ask you to kick off, let's get straight into things. Oh, sorry, I was just slightly distracted. I will kick off straight into things and ask you, Ben, um, to, to, to describe what you were up to before and how you first got into property. Okay, so um, it was quite a change. For 17 years, I um, I was hopping from country to country, um, helping deliver elections in post-conflict countries. Yeah. So yeah. I started out in the Balkans, in Bosnia and Kosovo, then went out to Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Egypt, Nepal, all sorts of places through the Middle East and also out in Asia, and. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it was a it was a great job. It was fascinating. We go in and do some amazing projects and really feel that we were making an impact in those countries by helping the peace process to the next step. Um, but I, I managed to acquire a, a wife and, and children along the way. And uh, obviously priorities change when, you, when you've got children and a family and the, the hopping from place to place just got a bit too much for us. So we thought, let's go back to the UK and let's um, Let's, uh, you know, let's move back there full time and, uh, and see what happens. And, and we just, uh, it, was, it was almost a, a chance encounter of an advert that, that Zena saw for a two hour property seminar down in Bristol. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, was, it was from the Rich Dad Poor Dad franchise. And yeah. so we went down and we were just sort of blown away by 
what we saw property could do and what property could do for us. And yeah. um, uh, and I must admit, I'm, I'm I'm a little bit cautious sometimes on these things. And I, I, I probably would have gone away for the night and thought about it. Yeah. I sort of turned around to tell Zina that's what we we're going to do. We'd have no reason to rush into it. We'd, we'd have to think about it. Yeah. And she's already, she's already sprinted to the back. <laughs> and she's signing us up for, for the course. And uh, to this day, I don't know if, if if I'd if I'd actually gone and thought about it, whether we'd have signed up for it, but it was the best choice that I never made, to be honest with yeah. you. Yeah, <laughs> thank good. I love Zena's style. So <laughs> there you go. You had already signed up before you knew what was happening. Um, exactly. um, tell us what happened next. Then what's the next? What's the next part of the story? So we we signed up for the training. Um, we did. I think it was a, it was initially a three day event, which again blew our minds and. Um, and really gave us the, the, the idea that property was going to be the way forward for us. But I guess as many people, you know, you can, you can, it was, it was a download of massive amounts of information over those three days and we wanted to do it, but we felt like we needed to a bit more help along the way. So we, we, we invested in, in more training and we really threw ourselves into it. And, and initially I was doing a bit of consultancy work on the election stuff and going away for three or four weeks here and there and then coming back and doing some work on the property stuff. But I just realized that I was losing momentum, you know, before I'd be going away on the property, on the election work, I my head would be turning to that and thinking about it and reading the papers in preparation for that. And so, and then when I'd come back, I'd have to write reports and there was a whole, I'd lose the momentum of the property. So mm -hmm. as of 2014 in January, I, I decided, let's just give it six months, let's do it full time for six months and see where it takes us. And And, and that was really, with the education support that we got, that was really where things started to kick in. And you know, I think in the January we'd we'd arranged we'd we completed our first deal. Then I had an auction property in, in February. There was a, a property through an estate agent in in March or April, and they just started. They kept on rolling from there, basically. That is fantastic, and I've managed to get my tech sorted. I've been scurrying around here to get so I can see who's commenting because we've had quite a few comments there. So, Nikki Taylor, uh, hey, Joanna Lawrence, hello, and we've got Ben Hollingsworth, he's a bit of a hero in Wales, just done a massive redevelopment we've seen online. Love the look of that, Ben. Um, Steve Ambler, hi, hi, and Mark Adams, and I can see Carleen is on uh, as well, and maybe other people who I can't see. Give us a thumbs up or ask any questions that you've got. But meantime, let's crack on, Ben, with how you then went on in 2014, so not not in the previous easy easy days, yeah. you then bought uh, 18 properties in, in 18 months. Uh, tell us about that. Well, I mean, I you know, I, I briefly covered a, a few of them there. Um, we just we were just keen to build a, a portfolio very quickly, which um, which replaced my income from working abroad. Uh, and you know, I, we were going to some difficult places, so I was pretty well paid for doing that. Um, mm -hmm. And so we we set ourselves some quite high targets in terms of the income we needed to replace to 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 maintain a decent lifestyle and, and to you know to give our kids a good a good life as well. So. That was the, really the motivation for it. Much mm -hmm. drove us forward in terms of finding lots of deals. And as you say, raising, we didn't have enough money to buy 18 properties in 18 months. So it, we had to go out and uh, and raise joint venture finance. Mm -hmm. um, and and we, you know, we raised about, as you say, about 600,000 pounds in the first 12 months or so. I mean, mm -hmm. since that, we probably raised quite a bit more, to be honest, but- um, Okay, I've been down playing it. <laughs> Well, no, no. I mean, that that was certainly what what we used in, that, in the first eighteen months, um, and uh, and yeah, I mean, eighteen properties sounds sounds a lot, and, and to be honest with you, it was I, I wouldn't recommend that anyone does that. To be honest with you, because oh, right. it was really hard work, um, yeah. and, and I think I, as we as I explained to you the other day, when we got to the end of those eighteen months and we had eighteen properties, we realised that we'd been doing a really bad job of actually managing the properties, and so the next probably year or so was was a period of consolidation. Where we started putting in place systems and making sure that we were getting the most out of the properties we had. So um, I think it, uh, one realization I've come to over the past few years is that it's not about the number of properties you have. Sometimes it's about getting the most out of the properties you have, and sometimes a smaller number, which are more effective yes. and managing better, can be a lot better for you than just vast numbers. You know. Absolutely. Um, that's, that's a really good, really, really good point. But still, you did get these 18. So what I want to know, Ben, is 
where do you start? So you're standing at the starting line thinking, yeah, I really want to go into it. Tell us about the first uh, property and the, and the decision making process be behind where you went first and, and sort of an overview of, of how the numbers looked on it. Um, oh, an overview of those numbers. Uh, OK, so um, so this was actually it was someone we met on the training course and um, he had found a property in, in Hull. We were looking to invest in Leeds. Uh, and there's a whole story behind that, but we decided that we were going to invest in Leeds, which is not as close to Bristol as as it could be. Mm. Um, but we'd we'd found that there was a, a lot of properties there that we thought were good investments. Yeah. So we thought, um, uh, and Bristol is very expensive, so we wanted to go somewhere where there were lots of properties that we could get because we wanted to build a portfolio quite, quite quickly. So Leeds is always settled on, and we thought, you know, if it takes a few years of driving up and down that motorway, then then fine, so be it. You know, it's it's all putting an investment in place for our future. Yeah. So we were looking in Leeds, and he had found a property in Hull, um, which is not that far away from Leeds. And so we thought, okay, let's have a look at it. He had hoped to fund all all the funds for the for the purchase himself. Um, it had fallen through, so he was looking to put half of the money towards it, and we'd put half of the money towards it. And it was actually it was an it was an annex to a guest house, um, which would which would be converted into a HMO, a seven bed HMO. Yeah. So that was all, the planning permission was all, all in process and he got quotes from the builders. So we had a lot of the due diligence done. Mm -hmm. We went up to see it and we thought, yeah, this is a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. So we so we decided to go ahead with it and, and, and we bought it with him. So there was, there was myself and Zena and, and him and his wife. We went in as as partners together in, in, a, in a limited company. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how we bought that, that property. So it was 50-50. And 50-50 on the investment side and 50-50 presumably on the other side, um, mm -hmm. equity and cash flow. And then were you, well, because you're so far away, was he local to that area? He was not. He was in Bristol as well. Right. So you were you were both having it managed. You were having it managed on your behalf. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I managed the renovation of it. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, we, we got an agent to manage the actual the rental of the property. So, Great. Yeah. And... Um, Tell us about the numbers on that one, that Ben. So it, I think we bought it for one hundred eighty-five thousand, mm -hmm. and we spent we spent about forty thousand pounds renovating it. Mm -hmm. So that's two hundred fifteen, and then it was valued at uh, it was valued at two eighty. That was wasn't quite as much. We were hoping to get a valuation over three hundred. Mm -hmm. It was valued at two eighty, and I think we got a mortgage on it for two hundred ten. So. We got most of our money out. I mean, there's obviously other costs as well involved in there. So we le we left a bit of money in, in the property, but um, but yeah, it was it was a, it was a good first a good first property to get. Fantastic. Um, yes, you're only living about five k, unless my maths is askew. Uh, so I think that anybody's got to say that those are good numbers. If you're only leaving five k in the investment and it's cash flowing you, uh, how much do you reckon? Or what was the t gross rent then on it? Seven beds is quite tasty. Uh, it was about two, about three thousand pounds probably. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's good figures. Yeah. And then, what do you reckon um, net income? Probably about twelve hundred pounds, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So a, a fantastic, a fantastic little deal. Twelve hundred pounds a month. You've you've made your money left in back within a year. Um, yeah. Can't argue. So, uh, so you went on from there, and was it sort of more of the same? It's more of the same. We're doing lots of viewings. We had. Um, I, I really think uh, property is about numbers. Property is all about numbers. It's about knowing your numbers on the properties. So knowing what you're buying it for, what it's going to cost you to renovate it, what the end value is going to be, what you can get on a remortgage, and of course the cash flow side of things as well. What, how much money the property is going to give you every month. So you, you have to know all of those numbers really, really well. But we also played the numbers game in a different way in that it was all about, it wasn't about getting hung up and emotionally attached to, you know, oh, we saw this lovely property, I think it'd be a great investment, you know, and being attached to that and really wanting that deal to work. Mm -hmm. It was about having, we, we, we aim to have about 40 live offers out at all times. Wow. So, you know, you can't get emotionally attached to, to a property when you've got that many offers out. Yeah. Just, put, yeah. just churning the offers out, going to do viewings, churning the offers out and, you know, they all get they pretty much all get rejected at first but what we found was you keep chasing up with the agents and, and you say oh i see that property that offered on is still on the market uh, you yeah. know a couple of months later and you know my offer's still there if, if, if you're interested and, and sometimes yeah. it would take a year for, for a property to come back to us but 
but yeah. we found um yeah doing the chase up and the follow up really was really effective so i think there's two real key things there and i would never have guessed this number but really 40 <clears throat> offers out at any one time and the success is in the follow-up because these cheeky offers uh, normally get refused first time around and most people are not following up so great golden nuggets there mm. so with the 40 offers i mean how many viewings were you going on per week uh, what do you think are the magic numbers in time if you want to progress at this 18 properties in 18 months which you don't recommend <laughs> <laughs> definitely don't do it um gosh how many how many viewings uh, I mean, I was probably going up and spending a couple of days a week in Leeds. And also I, at that time, I was working with um, <laughs> a friend of mine from university. I'd convinced him to give up his job, uh, a very, very well paid job as, as a managing director of a manufacturing company yeah. and go move over to property investing. So he he lived close to Leeds. Oh, wow. He was doing yeah. things as well. So we, we were sort of we were doing sort of a deal where. You know, we, we put offers in jointly together and the first one that comes up and gets accepted, he'll take and the next one I'll take and then he'll take. Yeah. So um, I, I would guess we're probably doing something like, I don't know, at least 20 viewings a week, I would have thought. Blimey, that's crazy. So 20 viewings a week, 40 offers in any one time, boom, and then you're, you're, you're moving. And then you, you had your first one under your belt, good deal. Uh, how did it go on the refurb? Because that would have been your first refurb you were managing, or would it have been? Was it? Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, it was. Um, I, I mean, I think I, probably of all the builders that I've used, he's been one of the um, the fairest and, and the nicest guys that I've worked with. So that was that was actually uh, it, it, you know I've had some bad experiences with builders. That was definitely among my better experiences with builders. Um, it went over budget as it always does. Mm. Um, and particularly with an old building, you, you sort of expect that when you start when you start doing the renovation, you uncover things that you just can't know until until you start ripping off wallpaper or taking down walls or or whatever. So it went over budget, but not significantly. Probably, you know, within ten percent of what we budgeted, which is which is not too bad to be honest. Yeah. Well, let's move on to, um, we won't go in order then because you were doing a lot of these sort of deals. You did, you did, but you bought a block of flats, I know, you split the titles. But the one that really uh, I found uh, quite exciting was the uh, pub. So, okay, yeah. The story about the pub. Now, guys, this is the one where um, when, the, when the last phase of the refurb is complete, it will be grossing £100,000. Uh, per year, I nearly said per month, one hundred thousand pounds per year. Great um, really investment from from one building. So over to you, Ben. How do how do it all work out? So it, it, this this is actually a very long story, but, uh, so I'm going to try and condense it as much as possible. But basically, this it started out as a rent to rent deal. So um, so we sent out letters to landlords, and this landlord came back to us and said, I've got an eight-bed HMO, um, which I'm interested in you managing for me. And it turns out it was an eight-bed HMO above a pub. And um, we went to see it, and we, we were not sure about it. Mm -hmm. um, and probably if it was by itself, we probably wouldn't have accepted this deal. Mm -hmm. But we knew the landlord had a lot of other properties as well. And so we thought this, this is a gateway into that landlord and potentially other properties. And, and that's the way it worked out. And then we've, we've taken other properties from that landlord because of establishing a relationship on this one. Um, but still, we weren't going to take it because the pub was too noisy. It was making a lot of noise upstairs. But he said, well, the lease is coming to an end on the pub. So I'll kick him out in a couple of months and you can take the property then. And we'll develop downstairs into a cafe or something. You know, not, nothing too noisy. Mm. So we did that. We, we managed the property for about a year and a half. And um, that worked quite nicely. It, it, a nice rent to rent deal, probably t making us about eight, eight, 800 to 1,000 pounds a month. Mm -hmm. So nice in itself. Yeah. Anyway, he came back to us <clears throat> about two years later and said, I'm interested in, in selling the building. Are you interested in buying it? And, and, and he had planning permission to convert uh, a storage room at the back of the pub into a one bed flat. There was already a studio at the back as well. <clears throat> and then convert the pub into two two bed flats. And we said, well, I said, I'm interested. Two two bed flats are, are not of in, any interest to me. Mm. Uh, and we looked at his plans and, and saw some easy ways where we could turn two two bed flats into a six bed, six en suite HMO. <clears throat> and, um, wow. and the beauty of it was we could do it in a way that didn't require planning permission. So yeah. 
you can merge units uh, without requiring planning permission. Mm -hmm. So we basically, we developed it out as two two bed flats, but without putting in the second kitchen, had that signed off and then knocked, and then knocked a, uh, a door between the two, did a little bit more uh, work. And then we have six, uh, six bed, six on suite HMO. So, um, but we couldn't agree on price because I thought it was going to cost quite a bit of money to do this renovation. Eventually, we agreed on price, and, and he agreed that he, he he had a building team. He agreed that he would do all the work on renovating the six bed HMO below. So we agreed a price of five hundred and twenty five thousand. He did all the work to make the six bed HMO uh, to 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 uh, develop that and the one bed flat as well. Uh, so now the, the building is a six-bed HMO, an eight-bed HMO, a one-bed flat in a studio. I feel quite sick when you tell me about this, Ben. I really do. But I just want to just call out a couple of things in, in this lot because really this is the reason, guys, why if you're not investing in HMOs, you really should be. Now, Ben, I need to ask you a question. What would be the rental income on the two two-bed flats? Uh, £1,200. Approximately £1,200. And what do you get on your six bed HMO? 3,100. Oh, no, 3,200. Three you've still got the bills to come out, so it's slightly different, but it'll be about double, won't it be? That's actually net. Um, yeah. you, instead of getting 1,200 for the space every month, you'll be getting approx 2,400, perhaps more for the space, just by having that little bit of knowledge uh, you see, some people don't know about HMO, so two two beds seems like a great solution. But you just looked at that straight away, and you just thought, "This is a six bed all the way." Um, yeah. The second thing I love about this is that you then negotiated with the owner in such a way, I don't know how you did this, uh, but um, the owner did all the work. You got a great price because now with the um, increased income, it's especially more valuable to you. Um, and, and there was another aspect to it where the owner was part funding it as well. So, yeah, so we, this is the few next steps, but basically we were able to get 90% finance on, on the property. So we're looking at 10% deposit. And uh, he basically said to me, look, if you need some help in terms of buying it, I'm happy to let, loan you some money. So we said, so I said, okay, fair enough. So I negotiated that he loaned me what I needed as the deposit for the property. So he developed it, he loaned me the money for the deposit. And so, you know, effectively, well, in some ways it's no, it's no money down. And we agreed that I would repay him the money over a period of five years. Mm. Um, now, as it happens, <laughs> he developed the, the downstairs and it was really, really good. We got tenants moving straight away. They were, they were really, really good quality tenants. Mm. And whereas we'd struggled on managing the upstairs and getting good quality tenants downstairs, showed us that the reason was not the location, which had been one of our initial concerns, but it was mm. the quality. upstairs was quite tired. Mm. So we realized once downstairs was done, we've got to we've got to deal with upstairs. So yeah. we're now just starting to renovate upstairs as well. Yeah. And we know now the quality of rooms that we're looking at, we know the rents we can achieve and they're higher rents than we've ever achieved in Western before. Yeah. And, and it went really, really fast. So it just shows that these rents are very achievable if you've got a good quality product. And yeah. it was a medium quality product before. So now, once we've done this, we're going to have eight ensuite rooms above, six ensuite rooms below, the one bed flat, the studio. And as you say, I think the figure that we'll achieve every month is, uh, where is it? So it's eight and a half thousand pounds a month <coughs> rental income. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's about, it's about a hundred thousand pounds a year. Yeah. And what would you say, um, <coughs> What would you say you'd be netting on eight grand? Would you say you're netting about six? No, I mean, the, the more... So the other thing as well is that for, for for buying the property, we had it valued. And I, I'd done some estimates of valuation, but I wasn't sure if they'd do like a bricks and mortar valuation or a commercial valuation or part bricks and mortar and part commercial for the one bed, you know, commercial for the HMO, one bed flat, maybe bricks and mortar. Mm -hmm. But they did it overall as, as a commercial unit and they applied... A slightly better yield to it than I than I had expected, and so I know now, based on that valuation that we've already had done for the existing property, that when we've done upstairs with the rents we'll get, we should get a valuation on the property of about eight hundred and sixty thousand pounds. Wow, wow! And we haven't talked about the purchase property oh, we, <coughs> briefly, but you're getting a reval on the whole lot of eight uh, eight eighty. You say eight sixty, I think. 
£860,000 if it's the same multiplier, which it, it possibly will be. Um, and you paid, um, you paid, Ben? We paid 525 There were There were quite a lot of purchase costs involved, stamp duty and, and so on. So we're probably looking at £50,000 of, of purchase costs. Mm -hmm. We're going to spend probably £75,000 on renovating the upstairs. So, you know, that, so all in, we're probably talking about £650,000 um, mm -hmm. purchase and costs after the renovation. But mm -hmm. what it does mean is that if we do get that valuation of 860, then 75% loan to value comes in at 646,000. So yeah. we might have to leave 4,000 pounds in the property. Oh, 4,000. It's, a, 4, it's a disaster, I know, I know. You get that back, get that back <laughs> in two weeks, Ben, is that right? Or is it a week? <laughs> that would be a month. So, a man at deal, if you've not been keeping up with this, um, Ben bought it, what was it? Under six grand all in, under 600 grand rather all in. And it'll be re refinancing at 860. Uh, and they'll get all their money virtually bar 4K back out. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a mammoth deal, but it was just having that foresight with the planning, with the with the work in the space, with the refurbing upstairs. And then you, you've you basically got that equity of over 300 grand. Oh, am I? Maybe 260, 300 grand. Uh, have you got the figure there, Ben? It's, it'll be 210,000 pounds of equity in it. Yeah, two two hundred and ten of uh, equity plus this hundred k um, a year, um, and I don't know what what the net would be, but well, I, can, I can tell that I've got the figure. So, so the mortgage on it is going to be about three thousand pounds a month. Yeah, probably monthly operating expenses, bills, and and so on of about a thousand pounds a month. Mm. Um, avoid allowance of probably five uh, percent. So mm. it, it shouldn't it should net about four thousand pounds a month. So that's mm. a I'm happy around with that. 50K, around 50k because you've actually allowed quite a lot of voids. I, I find that with it when it's a, a the en suites, you know, it's, it's minimal and especially it'll be quite new. So yeah, yeah, yeah that's a, that's a monster deal. So um, what the one thing that I do say about this is that rent to rent was the gateway to that. Yeah. So you're doing rent to rent and um, and then you you got this gateway open to you of all these opportunities that wouldn't that are really significant opportunities because first instance you were operating that property making around one eight hundred to one thousand pound a month at the top end that would have been about twelve thousand pound a year you had that for two years that's 24 grand or 20 to 24 grand um that you made on that property and then you've had all this extra on top of rent to rent so let's talk about that because um lots of people i know um, in the, within the group are looking to get into rent to rent. You were already set up with your 18 properties that you owned. Yeah. And then tell us about the, uh, the reasoning for going into rent to rent and why, uh, what you did, um, basically. Yeah, I, I suppose it was, it was two reasons really. <clears throat> One was that um, a lot of the properties we bought were HMOs, so we felt like we had that model quite well um, uh, well developed. <clears throat> and it wasn't just myself and Zena. I brought in a property manager, brought in someone who dealt with maintenance and refurbishment. So um, it freed me up more time to think about growing the business. Um, we didn't have funds available to go and, and buy more properties at that point. Uh, we were waiting for money to come back from, from refinances. And so <clears throat> we thought, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for us to roll out the systems that we have and and apply it to rent to rent. It's just effectively a different way of getting a HMO property. You're not owning it, <clears throat> but you're still you're still controlling it, and you still need to manage it. And it was just easy to roll out our systems and 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 way of doing things to rent to rent properties. So um, we tried a few ways of, of sourcing rent to rent properties. Tried through agents, and I know people do work effectively with agents. We I could never make it work to be honest with you. Just it was. Because most agents are managing the property as well, and, and then if you're managing it, and and you're finding the tenants, and it, it was just too many people in bed together. I, I found, uh, and that's not to say it can't work. It's just that I never, I, ne I never got it to work. So our approach was direct to to landlord, and we uh, basically wrote out to landlords um, with a series of letters, just um, uh, not putting too much detail into the letter. It was it was all about piquing their curiosity yeah. and making them think oh, that sounds interesting. Let's yeah. give them a call. And then that call, again, you're aiming at getting a face-to-face -face meeting where you can start to really establish a relationship and um, and yeah, hopefully get them to trust you and be willing to, to let you manage their property for them. 
So let's talk about volume here because you doing this for a long time what would you say is the the um optimum volume of letters or did you sort of send a few and then a big gap or did you have a regular letter sending um policy so how did that side of things work we i mean we will we well we did it in two places we did it in um <clears throat> actually did it in three places we did it in leeds um we did it in bristol and we did it in western supermare mm -hmm. The, the register in Western Supermare was only uh, about 110 people, so I emailed every person on the register there. Yeah. In Bristol, it was 2,000 properties are on the register. And they're not all HMOs, <clears throat> but we guessed that you know if they're if they're a landlord of another kind of property, they might have HMO somewhere, or they might have unlicensed HMOs. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so that was too many people to send to. So we 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 limited our search in Bristol to particular areas that we wanted to get HMOs in and basically narrowed it down to about, again, about 100 to 120 landlords that we were sending sending letters to. <clears throat> and we do it over a period of time. So we send one out and maybe two or three months later, we send another out. Mm. And it was about, yeah, about that, that regular touch point. And mm. you know, I think a, a lot of a lot of people are doing rent to rent. They send out one letter. <clears throat> they might get a HMO, uh, you know, they might get anything from that and they say, well, it doesn't work. So um, I'm going to find another way of doing it. Did you get something from the first letter, Ben? Uh, yeah, I did, I think, yeah. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. We, we typically got, <clears throat> I would say, between three and five phone calls from a, you know, a run of 120 letters. They didn't all, you know, they didn't all lead to a meeting, they didn't all lead to um, a HMO, a, a rent to rent arrangement, yeah. but yeah, three to five contacts, I would say. Yeah, that's actually a really good uh, return. So your letters must have been good. Uh, any tips <laughs> on what to do, what to do with the letters? Uh, yeah, what to say? You put a large check as a bribe in there. <laughs> um, oh. Okay. Well, yeah, there. there is, I, I think there is a system to doing this. <clears throat> so we. Um, we focused on what the pain points are for potent, for landlords potentially. <clears throat> so that the, the start of our letter, very very quick introduction. But then we, we're talking about, you know, are, are you suffering from voids? Are you struggling with you know, covering maintenance on property? Are you yeah. getting calls from tenants at eleven at night asking you to change a light bulb? Yeah. So <clears throat> the typical things that that landlords who are managing their own properties get a bit fed up with, to be honest. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> so we basically said, you know, well, we can we can offer you a solution to this and, and just put some very brief details in there. We did it on uh, a slightly different grade uh, of paper, so it felt a bit more sort of professional. Um, mm. We also I, I hand signed all of the the letters, <clears throat> and um, yeah. we I think I think the one thing that makes a big difference, and I probably shouldn't tell people this, but no, don't tell them. <laughs> no, I'm just. <laughs> Um, we used envelopes, which of course you have to, but we used coloured envelopes. Yeah. And it didn't matter what colour, but just a colour that stands out, and we'd, we'd hand write um, the envelope as well. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know what you like, but I, I, you know, I've seen myself do this since since I've used this approach. You get a chunk of mail through the post through through the, the letterbox. And you look it through anything else. It looks like a bill. Looks like a bill. Oh, there's a coloured envelope. It's, it's yeah. handwritten on the. Let's yeah. take that out. Let's take that out and open first. And uh, yeah, and so because it's got your attention, then it's it's not automatically. Think, oh, I'm not interested in that. What on earth is this? It's on you know nice grade paper, and yeah. uh, it's it's hand signed. So it was just about it's about getting through the sort of barriers that we put down for all the junk and spam and everything that gets sent to us. And uh, yeah, that that <clears throat> the coloured envelope and handwritten envelope really I found is a great way of doing it. Well, that is that is news because we we get a great response to our letters and we just use um, the automatic stamp and dock mail. Well, stamp we use, um, okay. and it's fantastic because you don't have to write any envelopes, you don't have to buy any envelopes, you don't have to buy any paper, you don't have to do a mail merge. Um, you just send them the spreadsheet and the letter with the spreadsheet mer mail merge places in it, and they sort everything out for you. So. Um, I, I just thought to myself, do you know what? We're getting such a great uh, return. I can't believe that these coloured letters with the handwritten envelopes really work. But you're telling me that they absolutely do. Um, so thank you for adding that layer to us. We're sticking with the lazy. We're sticking with the lazy way because the lazy way works as well. Well, I mean, I don't know. if you're getting good responses from that, then 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 yeah, that's 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 great. Are you still sending the letters, Ben? 
Um, I'm not. Um, and that's largely because we're tending to get, now sort of known, we're tending to get people approaching us about um, managing properties um, sufficiently that I don't need to go looking for, for additional properties. Um, and yeah, so, so that's why. I, I would still would think about it if, if we need to generate some more. Yeah, yeah, we, we go through lulls because you think everybody knows about, I, I think everybody knows about us now. I think it's a landlord in our area because we've been sending them letters for over a year and a half. But um, but recently we did have a lull, uh, and so we started sending the letters monthly again. And now the phone's ringing off the hook. I'm getting inquiries all over. So uh, it's just ebbs and flows, I suppose, of, of, of business as of business life. But thank you for those um, tips for getting started in rent to rent. The okay. other thing I wanted to bring out. Oh, I'm, I'm spoiled for choice because we won't be able to cover everything. But you've got your you've got your uh, guest house, um, which you bought originally with the intention. To, to turn it into an HMO, but you're running that as an SA, and you never intended to go into SA. So, would you? Would the idea of converting it into a HMO. It was the eleven an eleven bed guest house, <coughs> and um, I didn't think it'd be a problem getting planning permission. Uh, that yeah. to be wrong. But, um, so we, we went to the owner, and, and he wanted he wanted to sell up. He, he'd moved to New Zealand and, and wanted to sell the place. Um, but we were not in a position to buy at the time. And I did see on the sales details there was a little a little line at the bottom saying, may consider a lease. Mm. So I thought, okay, fair enough. So what we proposed to him was if it was a lease option. So we said, yeah. I'm interested in buying it. Um, I can't do it at the moment, but I, I'd like to agree a price for it now. Um, mm. And we'll lease it until we buy it. So we, we got a five-year lease option on, on the property. Mm -hmm. And he knew that we were planning to... Uh, try and turn it to HMO and he was fine with that <clears throat> um, but at the same time um, there was this I mean you know service accommodation has grown massively over the past few years and it was about the time when, when it was when it was really growing it was becoming a, a new hot topic as a, as a strategy um, so I put the planning application in to change into HMO which you know you can get you can get approval but you don't have to exercise it um, and then so I thought well you know until until it happens We'll run it as a guest house and then i thought there, there are two things i think that um are hard work with a guest house one is um being there the whole time to for when guests arrive you know even if guests tell you they're gonna arrive at five o'clock they may not arrive until eight o'clock or they may not arrive until 12 or or <clears throat> god knows what time um and the second thing was cooking breakfast for people in the morning mm. so we basically decided to run the guest house uh, along a service accommodation model so we put a coded entry system on the front on the front door and the room doors. Um, and we've got a system where you can create a code for the person and it's active for the hours of their booking. So from, from two o'clock in the afternoon on the day of arrival till 11 o'clock on the morning of the day they depart. And um, so we send them a code by text message and by email and that code gets them in the front door and, uh, and the room door. So that means we don't have to be there when they arrive. <clears throat> and then we decided, we're going to sell the rooms as room only, no breakfast. But what we're going to do is give them breakfast, but it'll be in the kitchen. They have free access to the kitchen the whole time. They can use it to cook meals. Um, and we'll put cereals, milk, fruit juice, bread, and spreads for, for toast in the kitchen. And they just help themselves. So um, <clears throat> it was it was quite difficult to change over that model. And, and there were guests who'd been at the guest house before and came back and it was done differently and they didn't like it. But, you know... I could also go back and <clears throat> and say, you 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 know we sold it as room only, so there's no talk in there of, of having a cup of breakfast, and uh, but it did. There was a lot of a lot of um, change management, I would say, in doing that, and we had to we realised that we had to manage people's expectations because they may have been returning guests and expected yeah. things to differently. So um, <clears throat> so yeah, so that's that. We've been running that for two and a half years now, and that's it's that's that's really good business. I mean, that probably. It, it brings in about £135,000 of, <clears throat> of revenue a year. Uh, but that's revenue. Don't, don't get excited by that. Yeah, um, yeah. <clears throat> there's a lot of cost involved. Um, yeah. We probably make about about two two and a half thousand pounds a month off that. Um, yeah. And it is, it, it is, it, there's a lot involved in it, to be honest with you. Um, but it, it, it's funny we did it that way because... Just like we jumped in the deep end with buying properties and bought a whole load <clears throat> straight away, 
you know, looking back, we did exactly the same thing with service accommodation. That's 11 units of service accommodation. I know they're all in one building, but yeah. instead of just doing one one service accommodation flat and learning that way, we, yeah. we really jumped in the deep end and, and uh, you know, 11 units all in one go. But 30 grand a year at net is, is actually really good after all the costs, which are many and various. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not bad. It's, um, I'm not sure whether I'm tempted to go down the service accommodation route at all, but, um, but it's nice. It's another property that's really uh, cash flowing well for you. And that's just two amongst your many, many, many. However, let's go on to another thing which really uh, interests me. And I know that a lot of people I think will be thinking about whether they're just starting up or they've, they've been going for a while, especially if they're doing it on their own, is when to get up to, uh, when to bring somebody on and how to bring somebody on. And because you have a team now of five, then. Yeah. So walk us through the process of that and how you've structured that and how you did it and any tips that you would give to others who want to grow their team so that the business is more uh, uh, less of less of a job and more of an investment vehicle. So I guess that that first eighteen months was we were really focused on buying properties, and obviously with buying properties normally, well certainly the kinds of properties we were buying comes the whole issue of renovation and, and refurbishment. Mm. So the first person that that I brought on was a friend of mine I'd known for years who was looking for something new to do. Um, and he was really good in terms of um, uh, he knew about sort of handyman stuff and and uh, and renovations and plumbing and and all that sort of thing. So um, he came on board really to help manage the sort of spec, you know, spec out very well and manage the, the renovation and refurbishments that were happening. And then obviously as as properties came on board, he, he moved more into sort of maintenance side of things and and, and managing the whole maintenance of properties. So he covers both things now. Uh, and, and he's managing the renovation of the pub, the top four of the pub. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so he was the first person we brought along. Uh, the mm -hmm. second one was, as I said, at the end of the 18 months, I realized that we've been good at buying properties, but not, I hadn't done very well at managing them. Mm. And that was partly just because of complete overload on my part. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the second person I brought along was a property manager. Um, and I advertised for this. I advertised on a website called Indeed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I don't know, I was just very, I mean, you, you hear people having nightmare stories about recruitment, mm -hmm. about spending all sorts of time recruiting people, and then they're a disaster. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a tough process to try and get rid of them then. And I mean, this this first guy that I found was, uh, he's absolute gold, he's, he's, he's amazing. Um, and he just came in and he had some property experience from before. He was really excited about about getting involved in, in, in property again, mm -hmm. and he's just been he's just been a, a massive asset and, and a really great guy as well. So, I think uh, him, but is it three and a half years then? <clears throat> with yeah. you, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's that's a really really great story, and you've taken him on as a, a full time permanent employee, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. And he actually um, he actually um, during the week he lives down in Weston. And he's actually got a, a room in one of our properties there, so I give him it very cheap. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, yeah, absolutely. Great start, but one of your biggest assets. Um, we, we've also got, uh, well, ours is a property assistant. He's learning everything. Um, I'm sure that he will develop on with us as well and, and go much further. But um, yeah, it's been great. It's, it's, it's transformed our business, really, because we used to spend, well, I used to spend, because Nikki's on other things, doing tenant management and everything, check-ins, check-outs, inspections, uh, dressing rooms, and you know, detailing, uh, corresponding and all of that. And so it takes so time consuming when you when your portfolio gets a little bit bigger. And so it's great to have somebody in who's learned our systems, who knows what to do, who's great with the tenants. Um, so kudos to you, because three and a half years is, is really good. I think you must be doing something right, Ben. The rumors maybe are, are untrue. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us who, who else you've got in your team so then uh, well with the guest house came a, a cleaner so the, there was a there was a cleaner who worked at the guest house and we kept her on when we took over it and, and she's been a real asset as well she yeah. really um takes a great amount of pride in, in her job and uh and uh, does a fantastic job for us in in making that a great space for people to come and stay yeah. in and we get lots of nice comments about how, how clean the place is and how diligent she is in, in what she does. 
Um, and uh, unfortunately, well, I say unfortunately, that's the wrong word to use, but she is, she's, she's pregnant and she will obviously be taking some time off uh, to have her baby soon. Uh, I hope she'll come back, but you know, who can, who so can tell? So you think in the meantime, is that what's going on then? Will you be is getting your opinion on while she's off <laughs> on that move? Well, she's not off yet, but uh, but yeah, she will she will be at some point soon. Um, but uh, so yeah, so she, she she came along with the guest house and and she's been a great asset to 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 the business as well. And then uh, shortly after we got the guest house on, what I didn't realise, I guess, about service accommodation is, and particularly taking 11, 11 units or eleven rooms on at the same time, um, it, it's uh, the, there's you know eleven potential guests to deal with, and you know it, it should service accommodation when, when they tell you on courses. They tell you that service accommodation just it's just it just happens you know and and uh, bookings come in magically and ching the money comes into your account and the guest arrives and they're happy and they leave and they're ecstatic they write a nice review and you're just sitting on the beach with your laptop or, or whatever <laughs> just watching the money come in a cocktail. It's, yeah. it's, i mean of, of all the strategies that we do service accommodation is the most hands-on and the most I intensive because all of those steps that i just talked about in principle can work like that but in reality you know guest credit cards fail you have to call them there are inquiries from guests we have phone calls that we have to deal with you know um do you provide towels is there is there duvets that you know all sorts of questions you have, you have to deal with and, and respond to mm. we have problems with sometimes with with, with problem guests who, who make a, a noise and, and disturb other guests We've we've had all sorts. I mean, running a guest house in Western Supermare for two and a half years. Believe me, there are some there are some stories I could tell you, which uh, which we'd have to do it later in the night after the after the watershed. After the watershed, uh, yeah. Okay, okay. I think we can do it like that, Ben. Although what's, I'm, I'm intrigued. I want to know what's been going on in your guest house in Western. Eleven units, thirty grand a year uh, net. I, I, well, I find that part very exciting. Um, but uh, I'd love a strategy that would let you keep more of the 135k that comes in. But um, right um, now, I wanted to talk about your best deal because I mean, I can't believe that there could still be another deal that's better than these, these ones, the, the big ones that we've been talking about. But there is. So, um, do you want to wow us with that? Yeah. Um, so, this was actually, I think it was the second one that we, that we, that we bought. And it was an auction property in in Leeds, and um, and there was it was it was actually a landlord who had gone bankrupt, and the, over a series of auctions they, they were putting all of his properties are, uh, up for auction, and I tried to get a few of them, but being outbid, but this one this one I did manage to get, and uh, it's it's quite a, a nerve wracking thing being in an auction and and uh, and bidding, wow. and. Uh, yeah, so I managed to get this. It's it's a four bed HMO and a one bed basement apartment on me, and I managed to buy it in Leeds for ninety three thousand mm -hmm. pounds, um, which I thought was a quite quite good deal. Mm -hmm. Now there were a few complications with it, and and um, I had to do a bit of work to get to the end result. But the end result was that it was valued at two hundred and five thousand pounds. So we managed to remortgage re it, uh, get a mortgage of just over £150,000 and effectively take about £50,000 out of the property. Um, <clears throat> now, the, we had to, as I say, we had to do a few things you know, to get there. So it was in an Article 4 area, which, which uh, probably a lot of, maybe everyone knows about, but anyway, it's a restriction on, on, on creating HMOs. Uh, and this, so this was a HMO in an Article Four area. It had never gone through the planning process, but it had been in existence as a HMO before uh, Article Four came in came into place in Leeds. Uh, so what I had to do was I had to go and prove that to the council, and that was a bit more difficult than I'd expected. I had to go back and show council tax, try and get council tax records to show that it it you know it was being run as a student property all the way back before the uh, before the Article Four direction came in. I did manage to do that. So then we got that through the councillor as a certificate of um, certificate, certificate of lawful use, I think it was. So we we, we legalised that the HMO part of it, and then the council said, "Well, actually, 
you've divided it into a flat and, and a HMO. Are, are you sure that that flat was ever approved? So then I had to go and do a similar process for the flat. <coughs> and prove that that was developed before, actually developed more than 10 years ago. So then it, so then we got it under um, established use. Um, so, so then we legalized that and then we split titles on the property. Uh, so we've now got two, two leasehold units and a freehold unit um, and, uh, and then we remortgage. So there's quite a few steps to, to, to go along and do, but obviously it was worth it because it allowed us to get revalued at 205,000. And basically, the property paid you fifty k. Yeah. Yeah, you got all your money out, original money, and then you got another fifty k out, which is a, was a nice, a nice little bonus. And yeah. finally, you've been really successful with the uh, getting uh, private finance. It's it's maybe lo mainly loan finance, isn't it, where people have loaned you money. Um, so how, which means it's great because it means that you own the properties. Um, so one of the best kinds of finance, really. Um, how have you been so successful, Ben? What are your tips for uh, for us? Um, I think I think just telling people what you do is is a great tip. Let them know. Let them know. Um, let them know your successes. If if you're getting successes, let them know the opportunities. Um, I mean, I think you know, particularly with uh, if, if people have got money and it's in a bank, you know, what, what is it earning them these days? Half a percent, a percent if you're lucky. I don't, I don't know what an ISA gets these days. Maybe it's two percent or something. Mm -hmm. Inflation is two, two to two and a half percent at the moment. So just leaving money in an ISA or in the bank, you're actually losing money because the value of that money is getting less and less. So I think you know the the smart people are looking at at what to do with their money if they've got spare money and realizing that sticking at the bank is not not a great option. So I think there's an opportunity there. I think I think you'd be surprised sometimes who has money squirreled away somewhere that could be used. And I think you know, I mean, obviously you've got to have a relationship with that person. They've got to trust you because they're giving you money. And um, and you know the worst case scenario is you could lose that money and they wouldn't get it back. Yeah. But I think there are there are ways of um, if that's their concern and it's a legitimate concern. Sometimes their their relationship will, with you will will mean that they're not too concerned about that because they know you'll do the right thing and then you know hopefully you will do the right thing but if they still have concerns there are ways of getting around it so we've secured loans uh, as a second charge or a restriction on the title on other properties before where, where we've got equity in them so it gives them the added level of security so i think you know that there are ways around many people's concerns that they might have about loaning you money. But I think the, the important thing is to understand what it is that they want. Some people, it's all about, it's the I'm just interested in the return. As long as I get my money, then that's all I'm interested in. Other people are less interested in, in the return and what you're gonna offer them, and more interested in it being a secure investment and maybe having a charge or some sort of security. Yeah. So it's about understanding their situation and, and meeting their concerns. I think that's very important. Absolutely. And you've just got this sort of honest face, haven't you, Ben? So that's why people want to give you their money, I think, um, as well as seeing what you can do. I mean, I, I feel that you do hide your light under a bushel, but it's uh, because um, I only learned some of these things, these bigger things that you've done when we had our little pre-interview chat. And uh, we've, been, we've known each other for ages and you host a mastermind group that I attend and really, uh, really enjoy all the big, big deals that we've got going in there. Now, Ben, is there anything that I haven't asked you about that you would like to talk about? Because we're coming into the last uh, six minutes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that the thing we haven't talked about too much. I mean, I've talked about the education that we did in terms of getting us ready so that we felt we could go and invest and buy 18 properties in 18 months. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think for me, education and ongoing education is, is a really important part of yeah. getting where, where we are now and going forward and, and pushing the business forward as well. I mean, we've got big ambitions of, of growth and, and doing big things. So, um, but for us, it's, it's, it's about continuing to improve ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and we've been helped massively by some of the people who've trained us uh, along the years. And I guess we've got to the point where people have started approaching us and asking us for, for help with, yeah. with training and education. And it's something that um, 
I actually enjoy doing. I've, I've really enjoyed sort of mentoring people. So it's something that we're trying to do a lot more of now as, as a way of, of giving back to people and, and helping people along the way to try and achieve some sort of security and financial stability for themselves in the, in the future. And uh, we actually held our first one-day course at the end of September, which was, uh, which was really good, which really went well. And uh, yeah, so we're, we're holding some more one day courses and, and we're very keen to, to work with people who might be interested in, in taking the next step in property and helping them along the way to do that. Fantastic. And, you know, as you can hear from what Ben's talk, just taught you, uh, talked about today, even, um, you know, you'll get the advice on how to know whether, whether property is a good deal, how to get some of these monster deals, how to be able to have that vision to see that, you know, this this old pub could be a, a six bed HMO, an eight bed HMO, and I think a flat as well, and, and how you can sort of generate that extra revenue from a building while still also be creating that quality product. And also, uh, Ben's also an expert, uh, as he's he's got so much private development in private development finance, private investor finance even, himself, that he can steer you along the right lines with that, which is where a lot of people do struggle. So Ben, have you got dates for the ones that are coming up that people might be interested uh, to attend? Yep. So the next date is in Bristol. It's at the Holiday Inn in Bristol on the 3rd of November, Saturday the 3rd of November. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a free event. It's, a, it's an all-day event from 10 till 4, where we cover sort of the, the foundations of, of successful investing. Um, we're doing it as well in Birmingham on the 24th of November and I think we're also going to try and do a date in London on the 1st of December um, well, and then we've got, sorry go on. Can you post these links on as well please, um, the dates and the links, um, you know yeah. in the please I can then post them into the uh, into the video edits so that people watching this after the live if you watch after the live if you've got any questions or queries you can put those in the comments tag 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 Ben, in. I'm sure he'll be able to answer afterwards. Um, but I really uh, encourage you, if you're thinking about getting started in property at all, um, go along to this free day, spend the day with Ben, and find out what the first steps are, and you know, take take your first step um, towards uh, creating the wealth that you want in your life, so that you can design the sort of life that that you want. Yeah, yeah, we'd love to have people along, so so please do. Great. Well, thank you. Anything else, Ben, before uh, we sort of call to a close? I don't think so. I think we've covered the most things, yeah. Yeah, no, no. It's been amazing to have you along. Really love what you've achieved and how you do it. And you also uh, stay so humble and you, you have got that lovely giving. Oh, somebody's put a lovely comment. Oh, thank you, Steve. Steve Ambler says, terrific interview, guys. Hugely informative. Many thanks. So thank you, Ben, because that's for your contribution and for coming on, giving up your time to talk to us all, inspire us as to the sorts of things that we could uh, be doing. So we'll put the links to, what's your course called? It's called Foundation of Property Investment. We'll put the links to Foundations in Property Investment. Um, eventually, they'll be next to the uh, video in the notes. Um, once Ben's, put, but Ben's going to post them in the group as well. So just click through on there, book yourself on. It's it's a free day out if nothing else, and I really feel you'll find it you'll find it valuable. Um, so thank you, Ben, for coming in. Thank and, you very much. Uh, I will see you all next week, guys. And we've got an amazing guest coming in next week, Milesh Lakani, who's put his um, latest deal on the group, which is a commercial uh, property that is taken to 20, um, a, an HMO, a 20 unit HMO, um, gone through planning, um, recently started in property only two years ago, um, has already got four HMOs, and now he's moved on to this massive HMO. That's going to be a great story, a great interview. So do join us here next week for that. And um, once again, thank you, Ben. And it's goodbye yeah. from Ben Goldsmith at Goldsmith Property. And goodbye from me. And I will see you next week, guys. Bye for now. Bye.